Jade, very excited uh, this evening for uh, European Times Anyway to be with you all uh, to cover this uh, very interesting topic. The title today is Mindful Leadership as a Tool to Avoid Mental Stress and Work-Related Anxiety. Uh, and I think this is, <laughs> it definitely hits me uh, personally, and I think it hits uh, most people around us. And we're just delighted to have Samantha here with us uh, to share about this, uh, this topic. And I say this because Samantha has a, <laughs> definitely a lot of experience having lived through not very uh, well-being oriented companies uh, and others which are very, very values driven. Uh, I love how she described, you know, when she said, well, well, how can we present to introduce you? And she said, mostly I'm being present during turmoil. And I love it that she has the bravery to go into companies and coach and organize leaders and organizations at times of turmoil, which seems to be never ending at the moment. So Samantha, we're very happy that you're here. Over 20 years of experience in the field of knowledge management and change management. Uh, Canada is her main experience, but she also had uh, in spans in New York, Hawaii, Texas, so much wider than that. Very, very happy to uh, read, Samantha. You were nominated as one of the eight women of the Oracle Women's Leadership Group Top Woman Awards. Uh, so congrats and great to see that not only your work is uh, a great exploration of something very needed, but you're also getting awarded for that and recognized for that. So as I promised, how are you, by the way? <laughs> I'm all right, thank you. Fantastic. What's, what's happening in Canada at the moment? Any, any good news to share or turmoil? Are we turmoil or good news in Canada at the moment? Well, well, Fridays in Canada are good news because it usually means that we get to venture off to a cottage. So I'm definitely going to be uh, heading to a cottage this afternoon. Beautiful. What a, what a beautiful plan. I love it. And mm -hmm. to get started, are you happy to start with those uh, two questions in whatever order uh, sure. you like? Okay, so one of the questions that came through my group was the first one, which was, how do you handle a sandwich position? And what Melanie meant by that is um, she found that she's in a situation where her, her boss is certainly not mindful and the people scurrying around her are certainly not mindful. So how can she maintain a space of, of being mindful and present when there's chaos around her? So before we jump into um, to problem solving, I'm wondering if we could all just sort of uh, settle for a moment and do just a, a brief centering exercise, because centering is really going to be a chief part of mindful leadership, and it really only takes a matter of seconds. So I'd love for this group to, to uh, go through that exercise. So what I would like you to do, and this is only a, a one minute exercise, is please just sit up tall and place your hands either um, touching your own skin as a very grounding method. So touch your own skin, keep your hands on your lap like that, keep your arms down, or you can keep your hands on your lap. But ideally you want the grounding sensation of having your hands on, on your own body. Then close your eyes and then take a deep breath in, hold and let it out. And then ask yourself, do a series of breathing in and out slowly. And as you're doing it, ask yourself, how am I showing up right now? What that means is, what kind of energy are you feeling right now? Are you feeling frazzled from your last meeting? Are you thinking about the questions? Are you thinking about your next meeting? How are you showing up right now? So now what I'd like you to do is please take a deep breath in. So now you've just acknowledged, how do I feel right now? And now I want you to ask yourself, how do I want to show up? So first you said, how am I showing up? Meaning you're showing up with a bunch on your mind. Now take a few breaths and ask yourself, how do I want to show up? You may want to imagine how your body feels, what your face looks like. Your face holds a lot of tension your presence. How do you want to show up? One more cleansing breath in and out. And out. And then we'll open our eyes. 
If you like, you can draw a big circle around you with a nice stretch. Come back full circle. So that helps you create your space. Also feels good. And then come back to the room. Did anyone have any thoughts to share about what that little exercise was like? I like how it, you know, sort of current future state. What am I currently feeling and what do I want to feel? Mm -hmm. So I, I like that. And making that distinction helped me to have focus on how I'm feeling versus before I didn't even notice what I was feeling. I was just listening to the group. So that mm -hmm. was good. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. It helps me to arrive. Mm. It's not just, oh, I'm now in this session and having thoughts all around. Okay, I got a question. And so if I if I take that in and it does something with me that I'm present, more present. And so when you say that you're ready to arrive, what do you think that looks like? Really recognizing who is with me and uh, yeah, be a good listener then I can contribute otherwise I'm just pulling some answers which because I know maybe a bit of the topic and then I pull something but I don't connect my thoughts and relate it to that what's in the room thank you very much anyone else yeah it helps to be oneself again and not a reaction to someone else mm. So just that one moment of saying, how do I want to show up? It helps you remember who you are. Yeah, I mean, that was that was the sort of thing that I was thinking also. It's about being. So in the first instance, when we ask the question, how am I showing up? It's kind of, um, I found with my own reflection that it's, it's a little bit frazzled. You know, I'm thinking of the future. I'm thinking of the past. But when you say, how do I want to show up? All of a sudden, you do come to the present. You do remember who you are. You remember that reflection in the mirror and how you want to how you want to present yourself. So that is um, actually really the essence, I think, of mindful leadership, which is which is presence. So um, we give people a gift when we're absolutely present for them. So what does that look like? It means you know putting away your technology or things that you might other, that might otherwise distract you during a meeting. But in addition, giving somebody your focused attention is a gift. So in the first question, how do I handle a sandwich position? What uh, Melanie was in my breakout group. And yeah, so I think I mentioned what she meant, said is that, you know, the people above are scurrying around and the people below are scurrying around and you're kind of caught in the middle. But with mindful leadership, you're really leading yourself mindfully. And so if you are able to be the calm in the storm, drive your own ship, that will help you be better able to manage other people's storms, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Because you're grounded, you're, you're the one that has the vision um, of the boat that you're driving, but the other people are floundering around like the wind in the air. So I have found that that really, really helps. Another way to visualize this is um, if you just have your, your hands, I'd like you to hold your hands forward as if you're uh, at a restaurant and you're a waiter and you're holding a tray. And on your left hand, I just want you to imagine for a moment, you can look at the palm of your hand or you could even close your eyes and just think of all of your past thoughts leading up to this moment. It could be your lifetime or it could be even just what you were, you were planning before you got on this call. Everything that is your past thought, I'd like you to put it on your left hand. Take a few breaths. I'm sure that hand is going to get very heavy soon. And now on your right hand, I'd like you to place all the thoughts you have about the future. Maybe you're concerned about when this call ends. You know, that could be something that is that is in your future or maybe your plans for the weekend or maybe that assignment that's due next week. All of that I would like you to place on your right hand. Now we have a gift here. And the gift is not what's on the left hand or the right hand, but the gift is the space in the middle. So we always have a space in the middle and that space in the middle is this present moment. So now, if you take a moment, just look at that space in the middle. Take a deep breath in. 
And a deep exhale. And then place your hands down. And now when you place your hands down, you'll recognize you have your past, you have your future, and you don't need to think of them right now because we're right here in the present moment. So that is sort of the gift of, of, um, of mindful leadership is being mindfully present for whatever is in front of us. Because when you do have those mindful moments of connection, you're able to have deeper conversations because you're actually seeing who's there and you're actually listening to the questions that they're, that they're asking instead of thinking about the future or being stressed about your past in the limited amount of time that you have with somebody. Um, the next question had to do with, so are you, are you happy with that, Melanie? Okay. So the next question- More than question, happy. Oh, good, okay. Thank you very much. That's my pleasure. So the next question had to do with um, change management and mindful leadership when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion in global organizations. Now, what's uh, wonderful from a Baha'i-inspired perspective is, or a multicultural perspective, I should say, is that um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a beautiful part to change management these days. So hearing every voice is something that we always want, just as you know, noble human beings, but it certainly doesn't always happen. But when you um, emerge a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative into change management, then you're really putting the spotlight on every voice because um, when you hear different perspectives, it, it enriches the conversation. So just like you know, flowers in a garden, if they were all the same color, they wouldn't nearly be as interesting. Um, or ingredients in, in a bowl of soup. If it was all the same ingredient, it would not be very tasty. But um, recognizing that uh, diversity issues enhance change management experiences uh, manifold. So what that also looks like is, um, is what, if you, as a change professional, if you can reach a broader audience by really tapping in and acknowledging their humanity and who they are, they're going to listen to you. And at the end of the day, organizations want you to increase adoption in whatever their, their effort is. So if you're only speaking to one piece of an organization, if an organization is multicultural and you're only speaking to one particular group, think about the huge piece of the pie that you're missing out on, not only for the richness of conversation that I mentioned, but also just the, the engagement, the people who are going to carry your message and help to transform the organization in the way that you're hoping to transform it. So definitely being able to speak, speak many languages, so to speak, um, helps change initiatives um, because it, change initiatives really focus on the people part of the journey in an organization. And that's why being able to speak to many different people will make the journey much more enriching and more successful. Okay, so now I see, uh, are you happy with that, Sarah? Yes, I would just one follow up because if it's a global organization, there's so many different cultures. Is there a different way to address the different cultures through a change management or do you tend to use the same method in the different cultures or countries. Well, yeah, I've worked in global organizations actually pretty much my whole career. And so it's still the same method. It's still making sure that you're asking the right questions. And I think what's important is having the right glasses on. You know, making sure that you have the glasses on that are going to see diversity and you're going to listen for it. So you can't make the same assumption that what what happens in um, in South Africa is going to happen in, in Toronto or what happens in Germany is going to happen in California. You can't you just can't make the assumption. You really have to have the diversity glasses on in order to, again, keep your keep the pulse on the on the humanity as you're asking the questions. Great, thank you. So the next question is, uh, let's see, employee engagement. How to create a movement led by employees which triggers staff well-being, a cultural change towards employee well-being? Hmm. Well, I think in order to, before you can create a movement, you really have to have the preliminary conversations. So find out who your people are. Um, find those people who can help you be your change champions and speak the same language as you and, and carry the torch. So for any change initiative to work, you, your, change, your change champions and at a higher level, even once, it, once your group is established, when you get the buy-in of leadership, your change leadership team 
they're really going to be the ones that can can help you uh, beat the drum that you're interested in. So really finding finding your people, getting your momentum, and then start to think about what your messaging is and how is that going to reach your audience. Maybe you know the audience well, maybe it's a small organization, so you, you feel like you know them well, or maybe you need to ask many more questions uh, to do with well-being. So maybe well-being for one group means um, access to nutritious food. Maybe well-being to somebody else, another organization means more time off, whereas somebody else might need flex hours. So understanding what well-being means to the organization that you're that you're interested in in targeting. Can I just ask uh, uh, on this on well-being? Because you mentioned a number of options. I have a sense that control is a very strong element of creating or destroying well-being. So even a well-being uh, option of everybody go to the gym takes away my control and actually does not create well-being. So I wonder if within this question, if you have a connection between well-being and control. Well, I, I hear I think I hear what you're saying. And, and I think I was trying trying to get at that by asking people what it what well being means to them, because when you do it yourself, then you're more intrinsically motivated to follow through. So, you know, my my kids version of well being would be to run around go around the neighborhood on their scooter, but you're not going to get me on a scooter. right? But you know, if if maybe I get a cool bike maybe I'll join them. <laughs> so yeah, so definitely um, when, when you have control of, of what your steps to well-being will be, you're more likely to engage because it matters to you. And mattering is actually a, a huge topic in the science of applied positive psychology. Because at the end of the day, you know, even the, in the diversity initiatives, we all want to know that we belong and that we matter. Otherwise, life can be um, can feel very difficult and, and very heavy. But if we know that we matter at, at the small scale, even somebody just asking us our thoughts, then that helps us feel more tied in and, and with a greater sense of belonging. And now Wendy asked, how can what we believe, ethics and values, become reality? I believe that we live our ethics and values every day. I think we model them. We can't just say, this is, this is what I value and put it up on a poster for some future initiative. I believe we have to live our values every day and bring that into our work. You don't only model them, but you speak the language of values. So you're using words like justice uh, in your correspondence. So people even have to even pause to think what that is. And when you speak about, about virtues and values like that, they, they resonate with people on a much different level. So if you say to somebody, you did a good job, that's one thing. But if you say you were diligent, creative, and genuinely trustworthy, wow, does that ever, does that ever strike a different chord? So I can hear, I can understand that when you speak those words to people, um, and own them, that it makes people think. And it's also a teaching opportunity. So I think you'll find your own loopholes for how you can do that. Well, I don't want to project. I'd love to hear from everybody else. I can, I'm happy to give my, my own examples, but I'd also um, love to hear from, from the folks here. So let me open it up, and then I'd be happy to give my own examples. So would anyone like to share how they um, bring their values into their day-to-day -day work? Yes. Just last week, you know, in, in our company, um, we have a lot of backbiting. And one and um, last week, my, my, a good friend of mine came and, and she said a lot of things about an, another teacher and actually she's true. <laughs> and we, we, we were thinking and we said, how actually, and I was actually citing a quote and, and said, um, it's from Baha'u'llah and, and it, it, it said, how could you, forget your, about your own faults and talk uh, about the others and, and talk about the faults of the others. Then she looked at me and she said, yeah, but if you don't express what, what, what is bothering you, it stays stuck in yourself. And then I said, yeah, you are, you are so right. And then we thought again. And then we, we, we realized actually that everything she's saying about the other person in the conversation she had with the other person, she should have told her directly. And then we were thinking, yeah, because she, she actually um, had to do something she didn't want to do. 
And actually she could have told the person, hey, actually I, I don't have to do it and I don't want to do it. Is there another solution we might find? And, and then she said, yeah, you're, you're right. But, and then we, we, we have some Germans in our, um, in, in, in our stuff and they are always quite direct and Swiss are not direct, you know. They just, um, yeah, they accept everything, but then it's, it stays inside. And then we said, yeah, we have actually to be like the Germans, but the tongue has to be different. It has to be in a nice way, in a smooth way, and not so, so directly that you offend the, the, the other person. And actually today I saw her and, and it was our excursion day. And I saw her in Zurich and I said, hey, so you, you didn't have to go to the, you didn't have to go to Schwitz, you didn't want to. And then she said, yeah, uh, I, I listened to our conversation. I followed the, what you said. And I ta talked to the person that I said, I don't want to go there. Let's find other solutions. And we, we laughed a lot. Oh, that's wonderful. So by by speaking up and articulating mm -hmm. what they uh, what she was feeling and being truthful, so they're the virtue of truthfulness. Um, she was able to be truthful in that situation, and it helped her to set her own boundary because she recognized sort of what her what her boundary was. Lovely. So teachable moments. That's how we can help uh, live our values. Um, well, I guess I'll just share my own just for the sake of um, sharing and learning is one thing that I do whenever I join an organization, either as a contractor or if I'm working somewhere full time permanent, is I see how I can tap into the women's group. Because in the women's group, there's a, a real platform for connection and for uh, having some higher level conversations. And also what it allows for is it allows for those teachable moments. There's usually some um, some room for creativity. So for example, at Oracle, <clears throat> there was a, uh, it was International Women's Day and they gave a talk and, or they uh, were, were giving out awards. And I noticed that, you know, four out of the five top nominated women, they all had positivity in their descriptor. And so I went up to them and I said, you know, I'm, I'm doing graduate studies in applied positive psychology. I'd be happy to give a talk to the group. And they didn't really know what I was talking about. So I had a separate call with them. And at first, when I got on that call with them, I was on the phone with them for about 10 minutes. And at first they said, no, you know, we're really busy until the end of the year. Within 10 minutes, they had me create a 10 part speaking series and I became a coach. So I coached on Fridays. Um, the winner actually of the top women award, uh, she asked me if I could be her coach and she was the first one. So it, these um, extra groups that you have at work, they can really work to be platforms. So even if your um, immediate job, you may feel like you're a bit stifled or maybe you're struggling a bit, when you can reach out and be part of these other groups, I think you can still have an impact because you're reaching sort of out beyond your desk or beyond your regular scope of your work and you're able to reach a wider audience. And we know that when we have meaningful conversations, they, they feed off each other and they build their network. So just like this, this wonderful uh, EBBF, you know, we have these conversations and then you can carry, carry them on once you've had some engagement and, and understanding of, uh, and learn something new that you wanna share. So that's how I do it at work. Also in change management, um, uh, because it's so focused on people, um, I really do follow the whole journey of the people going through a transformation. I'm, I'm so passionate about it, I can almost hardly explain it. <laughs> because if I look at a, a project timeline, I really see the people along that timeline. So I think, what do they need to know? How can I help them? And I'm, I'm constantly in my mind saying, how can I help? Like, I don't want them to drop the ball on that person. Um, there's a framework that I really enjoy. It comes from positive psychology. It's called the Me, We, Us framework. And what that means is when you're implementing a change, you look at how change affects the individual, how it affects the team, and then how it affects the organization. And so I really enjoy that me, we, us uh, framework. And again, showing up with, uh, with that presence of I'm here for you, that's what, that's what drives me. And that's how I'm able to go through these very large initiatives um, mindfully. I, I have my days, <laughs> have my days off from being mindful, but um, that's that's the, the torch I carry anyway. Okay, so let's can, can I can one. I can you go a bit deeper into this? Because 
the resistance to change is usually not an organization one, it's a personal one. So it's a very good idea. We should change and innovate and be mindful and whatever, but then people resist it. So can you say more about how you start from the individual and what that first conversation looks like to drop down the inevitable barrier that usually arises in companies? Sure. So resistance often, if you replace the word resistance with respond. So instead of saying, how are people resisting change? Say, how are they responding to change? It helps to uh, change the perspective on what the conversation is. So if there are some um, individuals, you know, usually you get in your project team and people are quite open about their thoughts about, <laughs> about the organization and what's going on. And legitimately, you could be brainstorming who are the resistors. So it's when you, that's when you want to learn more about who are these people and what are their conflicting, there's usually something conflicting, um, conflicting work demands, maybe, maybe a conflicting business demand. There's some sort of a, a, a struggle that they're not articulating, which is why they're resisting. So for example, maybe there is a fantastic uh, new technology initiative that will really help them, but they are so busy. They have so many clients and being client facing is their number one priority that the thought of even changing their, their computer system would be overwhelming. So instead of articulating that and finding a path, they resist it. But through conversation, that's when you can understand and then consult with them about how, how you can move forward together. Um, th that's what I do with resistance. Okay, okay, oh, Diana, okay. How to cope with stress and anxiety when you don't have meaningful work? Well, gee, this is a big one. And I guess I kind of answered it um, in that looking outside of your, if, if, if keeping your job is something that you need to do, meaning that not everywhere, has, sometimes it's difficult to find a new job. So maybe you need to stay in your current job and you're just trying to find a way of, of how can you stay in your job and yet find meaning so that you're happy there. So there's different ways of doing it. Again, joining these, whenever something goes wrong, and this, this goes in your personal life as well, when things are going wrong on a small scale, like your intimate group, like yourself or, or your immediate group, your family, or in the work case, your team, you feel better if your community is stronger. So being able to be part of a larger community can help you still feel um, healthier on your work journey, because you do have those folks that you speak to, those people that understand, uh, people that help you want to get up in the morning and engage with work, people to chat with, people who have uh, friends at work are more likely to stay in that job for a longer, for a longer period of time because they do feel connection uh, to their workplace. So yeah, really reaching outside of your role. That's just one perspective. Another perspective is there's something um, and it is about knowing yourself better. So for example, there's a, a free survey and I can, I can put the link in there. It comes from the University of Pennsylvania and it's called the VIA Character Strengths Survey. And what the VIA Character Strengths Survey is, is it's a survey that was put together by 50, so five zero psychologists and social scientists spent three years studying character around the world. And what they found is there are 24 top uh, character tra traits that we all share. When you do this survey, your top five are how you naturally show up in the world. So it's effortless for you to be that way. So some, some examples might be um, justice, forgiveness, creativity, appreciation of beauty and excellence, kindness. These are these are values uh, that may show up when you take this survey. So for me, for example, one of my top strengths, my number one is appreciation of beauty and excellence. And when I learned that, I'm like, aha, that is why I get so excited about people because I see excellence in people. I see what they bring to the table. On a humorous level, it also reminds me why over the years I'll be in the mall <laughs> with, a, with a boyfriend or a family member and I need to stop and look at the pretty Christmas lights. Like I just have to stop in my tracks and take a moment and look at the pretty lights. So at least it helps me understand myself better. So I'm not crazy. It's just, I just appreciate it. Now, what this means for you is if for example, creativity is in your top five, what you would do is you would then look at your work week and you would say, where during my work week 
do I have the opportunity to be creative? And so, or where are you currently being creative? And if you notice that you're only creative for 30 minutes on Monday and maybe 30 minutes on Friday, then no wonder your heart is heavy and you're not happy at work. So what you can do then is look at that schedule, look at your top five and see how you can filter in your top five to your workday. Maybe creativity comes up by how you now reintroduce a meeting in a different way. Maybe it's a small scale, maybe it's a big scale, but it's one way of how you can um, help to bring into your daily work uh, what, what matters to you and also what comes naturally to you. The reason why uh, what comes naturally to you is so important is because it doesn't take energy. It's just, it's just natural. But when things are difficult, they take more energy. And if your energy is low because you're in a very busy work environment, then it's helpful to find tools to flow easier. And that is by being your, your natural self. So that um, does help with stress and anxiety is when you can, when you can flow easier at work. Okay, and then Doreen has a question. Anxiety and excitement to start a new soul program in a new region and in a new culture that I'm not familiar with. What are the challenges that I will face being new to the region and culture? So in general, just starting something new in a new region and with a new culture, this is something a little bit challenging. So mm -hmm. my, yeah, I, I didn't start yet, but I'm in this phase of starting it. So my anxiety is related to the start of the work and mm -hmm. I'm alone, I don't have a team. All, everyone is in Europe. So this is also working without a team or in colleagues here. I mean, they are all virtual is also kind of, <laughs> I don't know. So, I hear what you're saying, I understand. Um, so it sounds like you're going to be creating a new program and um, you're gonna be, in, you're in a new company, you're working alone and you wanna be, you're facing several new regions and cultures. So how can you tap into them? Well, I can share with you something I did at KPMG. Uh, when I was at KPMG, I was in a, their global knowledge group and um, I received recognition for the work I did because I was able to bring 12 countries on board uh, for one week. We ran 60 courses in one week and we had over 1200 participants. And after that happened, my boss said to me at the time, he said, you know, you did something that hasn't been done here before. He said, nobody knows who you are. So that was before COVID, right? It was in 2015. Nobody knows who you are. You're sitting in an office in Toronto, but somehow you got 12 countries to get on board. So how did I do that? I did that by, um, I truly believe in quality over quantity. So I spoke with the 12 people in those regions. I had one-on-ones with them. I under, tried to understand what their needs were so that I could speak to them so that when we were building this program together, it was meaningful for them. And that makes you wanna show up, right? When it's meaningful for you. So that's the approach I took is to, is to really um, pay attention. And when you build something together, that um, helps to, to uh, build connection. You, you, always, you always feel connected to people after you've helped to build something. So when you ask them what they're interested in and you're able to come, come forward with saying, hey, I'm putting together this initiative that will benefit all of us, then people wanna hear. So I think people on this call will appreciate my tagline. So my tagline was a unified approach. And so I would speak to people and say, you know what, let's do a unified approach to this initiative. It will help save you time, save in advertising, we'll share resources, we'll do it all at the same time. I'm here, I'm gonna help you. We'll put all of our energy into this one week to get it done. So it's enjoyable because you have the individual relationships, but then of course, it's also you get an extra charge out of uh, seeing it all come together. Thank you, Doreen. Did you have, any, I see we're at the end of the time here. I don't want, I just wanna be uh, mindful of that. Now, what are we now taking back to where we are? And so maybe just a short word or phrase where we all share something that we're taking back. I really like the framework, me, we, us. So I'm gonna Google mm. that. Um, I'm hoping there's a methodology behind it as well. Is that is that the case, Samantha? So I took a course on, um, on positive change and that was one of the items that they brought in and spoke to. So I admit, I haven't looked at the web version to see how they speak to it. And it is, a, it is a perspective we take. So the me perspective matters as much as we perspective and the us perspective and whatever you want to add. And uh, 
this is important and just to it, it's nothing new but we do that not that often hmm. so to really make it a routine stepping in each other's shoes and taking that minute um and there was a lot what you what you shared the and thank you for this and what i also took away i mean that that's a part of my work is to to say culture is not passport culture has multiple dimensions and bringing people together um hearing each other and talking to each other um that makes such a difference you know as soon as i now i spoke with some of you i've never met in the future if i will meet you again there's a link and that's what i think matters and it gives us a chance to start next time on a, on a different level of relationship so thank you for this great evening of, of insights um, so I'll just put a plug here that I'm finishing writing a book and the book is, uh, I've interviewed Daniel for it. So it's called um, Connect or Disconnect to Propel Change. So when you make a connection or if you end a relationship, whether it's a, with yourself, a personal relationship or a corporate relationship, how that affects us. So stay tuned. <laughs> and I'm happy to connect with everybody on LinkedIn too. To me, it's... Uh keeping the pulse on the human. That's one of the things I highlighted really struck me. Well, I, I really, I mean, I loved all of it. And I, I loved uh, particularly the kind of um, touch your own body part, the beginning mm. as a way of grounding, because I'm quite used to sort of meditating and so forth. But, you know, I think that was a really nice um, thing to add. I liked the exercises a lot, and I think they can help a lot at work. And I also found it interesting, you know, this to find ways to bring one's own character strengths into the work, you know, to, to look for opportunities. I really liked the, how we shared, you shared uh, how we can practice our values in our uh, daily work life. So the justice thing, how to demand it and how to even verbalize it. The idea of joining groups, this is also a good idea, Samantha, thank you. Uh, I will try to apply all these things and the backbiting things also, it exists everywhere. <laughs> so very practical things that I will for sure use in my new business here. <laughs> and thank you also for sharing the survey. I will search for it and try to do it. And thank you for this meaningful evening. Fantastic. Sam Thank Samantha, you. Do, you have, do you have closing words after all this uh, gratitude for that you produced and shared? I just have something closing, my favorite book that I'd like to share on the topic, but it's called Finding the Space to Lead, A Practical Guide to Mindful Leadership. It's by Janice Marcherano, Marcherano. And she talks about something called the purposeful pause. So what this is, is similar to how we did that, that calendar, ex that uh, visualization exercise was, was from her that we did at the beginning. And um, what she says is even while you're walking down the hall to get a coffee, consider that a moment to have a purposeful pause. So that means you're not thinking about anything else. You're trying to be mindful in the moment just to take a few steps. What does that do? It just helps to clear your mind so that you can be present for your next interaction. Thank you so much. So this is what makes conversation meaningful. Thank you very much for your contributions, all the questions, all the insights. I think we have a lot to bring home to our workplaces and also to enjoy our weekend. Thank you so much, Samantha. Thank you, everybody. And see you at the next Meaningful Career event. Bye.